of all is they're not taught to speak properly and speak, people have got nonsense ideas about speaking properly. They think that there's a standard way that's socially acceptable to speak. And they were having people voting in which they thought were best accents and they said Yorkshire. I don't like it. <laughs> It's so awful, it's terrible. It is changing now, but... If you listen to people talk, talking, many of them never talk on their own register. They're always fighting to be heard, so up goes the register and they talk above their own pitch. <laughs> oh dear. It's not important to speak like somebody else. It's to speak free from strain, so that you don't attract attention to how you say it, but to what you say, which is the only reason for speaking. The rest should be silence. It's just awful, that's all I can talk about. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Well, well, of course there should be uh, speech taught in all schools, not just in private schools, but in the state schools too. Uh, I think it's more important than reading and writing, if you want to know. I mean, what is writing? It's merely a mechanical way of recording memorable speech. Uh, surely it's better to teach a child to be able to make memorable speech than simply to record somebody else's. Yeah. I met him at a dance. I used to go dancing on a Saturday night at the Mechanics Institute in Otley and he'd just come out of the Air Force and I met him and then a few night, a few weeks after he used to, well often he used to come for a dance and then a few weeks later he asked if he could walk me home, which he did and of course from then on it was lovely. We got engaged in about eight, about eighteen months later, and then married probably two just after two years. It was lovely. In a cafe in Leeds, and he was in a queue waiting to be seated, and there were lots and lots of people waiting. And when it came to his turn, he asked the um, young lady in charge if he could go and sit across there. And that was my table. <laughs> oh, my Patrick. Oh, I don't have me crying. I worked at AIS. And Patrick must have come there. He were a plasterer at the time and um, there was a dance at the, at the well it was Garment then in Bradford and my brother was um, on the committee of the Royal Marines and Jean that worked downstairs she came up and she said oh there's a lovely chap that's come here working just for the winter because he can't get you know with it being bad for plastering and stuff and she said he's really really nice it's too nice to work here she said and he's going to that dance. Anyway, I went with my brother and his wife and um, that's where Patrick came up and asked me to... Oh, Jean, Jean introduced me to him as we were coming out of work. She said, this is Patrick who's going to that Royal Marine dance tonight. So I said, oh, hello. And we got to the dance and I danced every dance with him. And he was a super dancer. Really lovely. Yeah, I've been in love. Yeah, both. Yeah, I do both actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. 
I don't want to see this. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Clown one ten pence in a laughing head. my husband a lot. I mean he was only in his early 50s when he died but um, I miss him so much. Even now I still sort of look, um, you know, I don't miss him. My fondest memories is all the lovely places I went to with my husband. I did panto. I was a schoolgirl in panto, a schoolgirl. I was also a pie man and the um, the good fairy twice. I, I I got typecast as the good fairy twice. Um, what else? Oh, some Chinese woman. I was a Chinese woman. You know, I don't miss the theatre at all. I go occasionally, and I usually come out thinking, why the fuck did I waste my time? I, I once learned how to play the piano, yes. I didn't succeed very well. I love, I love music. Yes, I do. But not the music today. I can't deal with this bum, bum, bum pain. But I can, I can choose little bits of each type of, of music. Even some of the pop music, and some I hate it. Not the screaming type. I once came across a little boy who was very musical. And he had a great opportunity when he was a child in Britain to pursue a musical career as a bursar attached to a, the youth orchestra. And he wouldn't take it up. And I've never forgotten being told this because I said, why didn't you take it up? And he said, I don't want to carry an instrument about with me all my life. I want to be the instrument. What a wonderfully intelligent little boy. So Moses said to himself, how do I stop this? So he came up with four words of one syllable each. Thou shalt not kill. You can't get simpler than that. My definition of genius is, be able, is being able to say something profound simply. So to me, Moses was a genius. Now you're going to laugh, aren't you? Little pigs. <laughs> well, that's a new one. I don't know why. I think they've got such lovely faces. Turn your nose up at the pig. It does, it cannot shed hair. I hate hair. <laughs> oh, a deer, a deer, of course, absolutely. Oh, a little fawn, oh, I love deer. It's like cow's milk. Cats should not have cow's milk. First favorite animal, a dog, Shih Tzu. I have two Shih Tzus, uh, fantastic dogs. Um, I love them. Furry little things. <laughs> Furry little friends. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. 
Yeah, I do have uh, two favorite animals, actually. One... <laughs> yes. to death of dogs. I got mauled when I was seven with a dog. So I'm frightened of dogs. My favourite the goldfish. <laughs> Lots of fish. <laughs> oh, <don't>. <laughs> <laughs> <My> fish. <coughs> <coughs> to eat and what quantities are right for you because they're not all the same from everybody. Some people have naturally gargantuan appetites but they're six foot four. Other people are not necessary, um, what should we say, anorexic because they eat very little. They haven't any more capacity than that. You know what you get if you cross a Shih Tzu with a Bull Terrier? You get bullshit, that's what you get. I was an only child, but they were lovely parents. I never got hit or anything, and I could come, I could um, confide in them in all respects. Mm. <laughs> My mother was pretty grim too. I was only three years old, and uh, I came home from daycare, and my mom had prepared some food. And my daddy was in the kitchen as well. And I'm just a hungry kid sitting, food, food, food. You know how kids are. Uh, and I, make it, I made it some terrible noise. And my mom just wanted to give me the food. And my dad wanted to put something on the plate. I don't know what it was. But she took the plate and she gave it to me just to quiet up the boy, the screaming boy. And my dad flipped. And he took his fist and he hit my mother right, punched her. So she lost 12 teeth, fell on the floor, knocked her out. And that poor, my poor mother was laying there. I was a three-year-old kid sitting on the kitchen table. And that coward of a man left and fled, left, left our apartment, fled, ran away. And she was on the floor bleeding with 12 teeth on the floor. She had to call the ambulance, they had to come get her son, get the teeth together and get into the ambulance and go to the hospital and see what they could do, or the dentist or the hospital or whatever they went. That's my first childhood memory. Yeah, all through their children's lives, which is even worse. If people live through their children and their only, um, what would you call it, the only Raison d'etre for life is children. It's terrible. It's actually very sad. In fact, I wanted four boys. I wanted four boys, and I, I got a son, and then two years after I got a daughter, and my husband says, right, we've got, uh, we've got one of each now, so this is what we can afford. We don't, you know. We wanted them to be happy and, and do what we could. I don't think so, no, because I, should, I feel now that I'm not responsible for what's going to happen to them in this world that's coming. No, I've never... Well, my husband was an only child as well, so we've never... We've never... Um, we just left it to God to decide. <laughs> yeah apart from our son dying. 
I would, yeah. I, don't misunderstand me. I like children. I went to school with them. When my daughter was younger, we used to make pancakes, mm -hmm. you know, pancake day and all that stuff. And, um, yeah, she, she became a very good tosser. <laughs> I used to say to her, oh, you're a very good tosser. <laughs> but she didn't know what that meant, of course. So oh, look, Mummy, I'm tossing. <laughs> oh, bless her little heart. All action, which not even industrialists all understand today, all action, whether in the workplace or on the playing field or wherever, is a result of emotion. Emotion is always the motive power of action. Even if the emotion is only interest or the fear, which is very real in all of us, of survival. Well, I, I watched a program on television about the death penalty in America and I thought, my goodness me, if I was a person living on, a, on the bread line and having to sleep outside, I think I'd and almost commit something because they had, had everything in their cells. Everything, television, a lot. And I, I thought, goodness me, it um, makes you wonder, doesn't it? Many times it has been said that there's been um, death penalty when they've been innocent. I, I don't know, really. Um, I, I think it's... I don't know. Um, I think if, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't think hanging, I don't agree with the hanging, but I think probably an injection, yeah, I think that that's what they probably deserve if, uh, if they're guilty. Well, if the person is guilty, and there's absolutely no doubt that that person is guilty of taking another's life, then yeah, their life should be taken, you know, the old eye for an eye. There's a lot of common sense in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know something, here's a statistic. Whenever a murderer has been electrocuted or given the injection or hanged, he's had his life taken. They've got a, a record of 100% rehabilitation that he does not go on to murder again. I don't know. I think so, if they've got proper evidence, proof, yeah. I don't know that I have a favourite book. It would have to be Macbeth. Oh yes, Gone with the Wind. <laughs> That's many years ago, but that, that was absolutely lovely. Don't do those. Or oh, something romantic or period drama. I don't like the cowboy things. And... I like Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. That's really good. Macbeth is about ambition and power and the throne and the crown. And what I would do is have an enormous crown on the stage and the witches would come out of the crown. And then the, the crown would be divided into bits and they would flap down. And Macbeth would come into the crown. As, and as the power, the, the driving ambition drives him further and forth, the crown will slowly close in. And then it'll go into the, the flies so you'll just see the bottom of it, but always be aware that he's reaching for the crown and the power and Lady Macbeth. And <clears throat> in the end, <coughs> excuse me, in the end the crown will come onto the stage and it will close in on him as he fights. And I would have the witches on stage all the time. They would never leave the stage. And the first scene would be repeated at the end of the play. Hubble, bubble, toil and trouble. And so it will be a cycle of power being evil and evil being power. 
Patrick and I got invited to this party and it was a really, really big house. And they had like a, a room that was like a disco and we were all dancing and then they decided to play these games. So all the ladies had to sit on these seats and they blindfolded the men and they had to touch everybody's knees to find out if they could pick their wives' knees out. <laughs> and my Patrick picked the fattest woman in the room. <laughs> And at the time, I was really thin. And he picked her knees out and she was really massive. <laughs> I think that, and everybody started laughing and I was really upset. <laughs> As the Greeks always remind us, a basic golden mead. Nothing too much, not even righteousness, they said. Of course, I, I like men, friends. Mm. Yeah. Do you mean lovers? Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, quite a few. Probably too many, actually. <laughs> Probably too many, but who knows? Who knows? No, oh, the nicer men. Yeah. If they were all like my Patrick, they'd all be perfect. I, I I prefer men as friends to to, go, to to women really. They they seem more. Um, I mean, they're more truthful. Uh, well, I like them slender and tall. Uh, I like them to have their own teeth. Lots of men, really. Lots of men. Mm. Bit of all sorts, definitely. A bit of all sorts. But you can't say there's a type, can you? You can't say, oh, well, I like men that have long legs and grey hair or something, but it doesn't work like that, does it? <clears throat> it doesn't work like that at all. You know, it could be... Some. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. There's different sort of men for different things, isn't there? There is, definitely. <clears throat> you know exactly what I'm saying. There is one man you could have, oh, well, he'd be okay for that, and that one would be okay for something else. And this one, well... That's pretty useless. Good for nothing. <laughs> good for nothing. Absolutely good for nothing. <laughs> when I was younger, um, I had, you know, quite, quite a few friends. Until I met my husband, then I thought he's the right one for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, I've got bedrooms. I've got peppers. And you can bring your little friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. One feels one has to go on. I've never, ever contemplated a retirement as such. What is retirement? Well... Two friends who live in Holland. They've done that. They both got cancer and they did that. The doctors are making us people live longer, aren't they? And I don't know whether it's a good thing or whether to let life just come naturally. Apart from euthanasia where people are really very ill and really full of pain, I think, it, I think I'd agree with it, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't like it myself, I'd be frightened. I'm frightened to die in. But um, I think if you're full of, it, you know, be really poor in pain, and you couldn't bear it any longer, it would be kinder. I'm, I'm exploring all different 
you know, different religions and most of my friends are of a different tradition as spiritualists and Jehovah's Witnesses and so I'm in mean, quite a muddle as to which I believe, if any. I don't know. I don't think so. I think you're born, you live your life and you die. Boom. End of story. I hope so. I hope so. I'd like to meet my mum and dad again and Patrick and our Tony. Yeah, I just hope so. I really don't know, but I think there's something. I don't know about, you know, seances and things like that. I would never go to a spiritualist. I'd never go to anything like that. I was driving with Evelyn once out to Villiersdorp in the Western Cape. And Evelyn is half blind. She's got detached retinas. And she's got various other problems, but it, when, dri when driving, the detached retinas are the big problem. Anyway, she, we're driving along, and her car, you could see the road through the floorboards. And the, it's rattling up and rattling and rattling and rattling. And I said, if, don't you think we should slow down? No, 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 I'm not going fast, I'm not going fast. She's rattling along and then she says, oh, look over there. And she turns the car as she says, look over there. So we're in the bushes and then we're out the bushes. And we're traveling along at the... And she said, oh, look at that lovely yellow bush over there. I said, Evelyn, it's not a bush. It's a traffic man in one of those yellow jackets. <laughs> And that is one of the terrible things about communicating, especially in education. It's not whether you will or whether you won't speak well. It's a necessary tool for your profession. And it's a necessary tool for lawyers, for doctors, and for human beings that don't want to make people have nervous breakdowns listening to them. It's a matter of health for the whole community. Oh, gosh. Stop smoking and drinking and, and take no notice of nature and animals. And yes, that's what they'll do. Go after it. If you don't do it, you'll always be stuck doing something you don't want to do. Or what if, or what if, or what if will always nag you why you didn't go after your dream. What's the worst that could happen? That you fail? Yeah, but you tried it. You had 10 points, you tried it. So you stand up, you brush yourself off, and maybe you try it again. And maybe the third time around, third time lucky, boom, it happens. And there you are, you're doing what you want to do. But if you don't do it, it's all these what ifs. Don't smoke. Don't don't start smoking. Uh, don't take drugs, which of course they get into the wrong company, don't they? Sometimes. Just to work hard. If they could, if they can get a job, and to love one another, not to fight. I don't like fighting. Just to love one another. I suppose most people, if they were giving advice to the next generation would say things like uh, work hard, don't be a criminal, love one another. I would say be worthy of being loved. Yeah, make yourself worthy of being loved. And you, of course, you will be if you are. Well, it's very much easier to give children a knowledge of facts than a knowledge of life.